Dear JS users, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I welcome you to this presentation on the topic of assessing flood impacts using a multi-scale geospatial database model. We are excited to share with you how advanced technology and different spatial analytical tools helped us with the assessment in this project. My name is Christina Wolf, and I'm very glad to be joining this year's ESRI Geodesign Summit on the topic of Resilient by Geodesign. I am a PhD student at Newcastle University in Geospatial Systems, and together with my supervisor, Richard Dawson, we have been working on developing a common database model for assessing flood impacts in different urban areas. First, I would like to give you a brief outline of the different topics I'm going to talk about. Let us first take a look at the issue of flooding with some examples of its impact on the urban environment. We will then see how the severity justifies the need for a better spatial framework for managing the impact of flooding. Later, we will look at various spatial tools that have helped us with the assessment in this project. And finally, we will look at the benefits of the integrated database model. Floods are regarded worldwide as one of the most catastrophic natural hazards, causing millions of lives and causing both financial and environmental damage. In general, there are many different types of floods, such as flash flooding, river flooding, and coastal flooding. Here, we are going to focus on surface water flooding. In England, every year, 2.4 million buildings are at risk of flooding from rivers or the sea, and another 2.8 million buildings are at risk from flooding from surface water. In addition, floods and the management of their damage currently cost the UK around 2.6 billion pounds. In our project, the city Newcastle upon Tyne serves as a study area for the integrated flood database model. Newcastle is located in the northeast of England and has a population of over 300,000 inhabitants. In the past decade, Newcastle has experienced several different flooding events. One of the worst storms occurred in the city and the surrounding area in June 2012. This flash flood, which is also locally known as the Toon Monsoon, overwhelmed the drainage in the city, and more than a month's worth of rain fell in two hours. This led to cars being left underwater and emergency vehicles, which could not pass through flooded roads. In general, there was a lot of chaos due to this flood. The impact of this 2012 flood illustrates the various challenges involved in flood management and the complexity of the urban environment in this matter. As flooding can occur within such a short period of time, we require high-resolutional urban data and real-time information in order to understand how flooding can affect the road network, how it can damage buildings, and how it can disrupt other infrastructure. Therefore, we intend to look at various data sources to gain a better understanding of the common impacts across different urban areas. These data can come from a variety of different sources, as flood management involves many stakeholders. Stakeholders provide flood-relevant data. They are responsible for challenging tasks during different stages of flooding, and they also deal with various impacts. A unified system with different data sets on a common topic such as flooding would allow stakeholders to better analyze and understand the impacts of flood events and also better communicate during different stages. Currently, there are different tools available that help us to assess the current risk at certain locations. One of these tools are so-called hazard maps, which visualize the risk of flooding. One example is the hazard map of surface water flooding, published by the Environment Agency. This hazard map provides us information on flood extent, flood velocity and flood depth. The wider the flood extent, the more buildings might get damaged. Flood velocity can cause running water to move more debris and can lead to more destruction. Flood depth is particularly important in this project because it is directly related to financial damage. Also, if electrical equipment or power stations are damaged, this requires a lot more water damage restoration and cleanup. 
This screenshot here shows us the extent of surface water flooding with a probability of 1 in 30 years. Combined with a postcode search, we can see that a care home is at high risk of flooding. These current available hazard maps can give us a general overview and help us to answer the following questions. Is my house within the flood zone? And are any flood alerts issued for my area? Based on these available data sources, we now intend to enhance the available hazard map information to answer further questions. Some of these include How many vulnerable neighbors require special assistance? And which roads get blocked due to flooding? In order to answer those questions and understand the different impacts, we need a data model that enables this advanced analysis. Therefore, in this project, we aim to develop a flood geospatial database model for heterogeneous data from different sources in order to assess the impact of flooding on the environment, society, and infrastructure. In order to achieve this goal, we follow a conceptual workflow supported by geospatial elements, which will be explored in the following course. First, we need to identify required and available data sets and extract them from different data sources. This data is loaded into the database either directly or extracted using standardized representational state transfer application programming interface services. To transform certain data sets and address potential data integration challenges due to heterogeneity, we use the Data Operability Workbench Feature Manipulation Engine. Based on these data sources, we can then design a relational database scheme with entities and spatial relationships, which we will later use for querying flat impacted environment, people, and infrastructure. In order to analyze and visualize data, we use both Python and ArcGIS API for Python within the Jupyter Notebook environment, which is integrated in Arc Pro. Further, we use ArcGIS Online in order to store data sets that we later visualize in operations dashboard in form of indicators, web maps, and graphs. In the end, we use the Experience Builder in order to publish the workflow of the project in form of a storyline. Now, the first component of the workflow we are going to have a look at is Jupyter Notebooks. We use Jupyter Notebooks in order to extract geographical boundaries for Newcastle and enrich those with hierarchical information. The video here shows the Jupyter Notebook environment with an Arc Pro. First, we can set the project environment. Then, we can extract for the defined study area the different geographical boundaries. We can run the code, and we see at the end of the script a summary of the total execution time for the extraction of the boundaries. On the left side, we see how the different boundaries are extracted. Here, we use the boundaries for the census reporting, middle superoutput area, lower superoutput area, and output area. Once the boundaries are extracted, they are added to the map and visualized. We can click on single areas and see the hierarchical information, which was joined to the area. In addition, we see how all the data sets have been added to the database. The execution time at the end shows us that less than 32 seconds were needed to extract the geospatial boundaries and enrich them with further administrative information, such as word name, city, region, and country. The next component is the Data Operability Workbench. We use FME to convert between different data formats in an automated, repetitive way. Here, we have compressed light detection and ranging data in LAZ format, which we want to convert in LAS file. In order to create the LAS file, which we can then later use for further analysis, we can create a spatial ETL tool in our geoprocessing toolbox in the ArcPro environment. Alternatively, we can create a tool within the FME workbench and save it later to our toolbox. Here we see how we can choose between different data formats 
that we would like to convert. Another option we chose was to convert digital elevation model data from ASCII grid to GeoTIFF. We specify the input for the reader, the transformation step, and the writer output. In our example, we now receive the LIS file, which we can open in Arc Pro for the further analysis. We designed a database model for Newcastle for the analysis of different scenarios. Therefore, we integrate static data. Data sources include the environment, society, and infrastructure. Based on the environmental data, we can identify impacted agricultural areas and crops. Data on society helps us to identify vulnerable population groups, such as one-person households, elderly people, and densely populated areas in general. We use data on infrastructure to identify flooded buildings, estimate their financial damage, and show further impacted roads and bus stops. We further show how we can include real-time data into our database model. Data sources comprise rainfall, river level measures, and traffic data on incidents and accidents. Combining both static and dynamic data, we aim to improve the flood impact assessment at different scales for Newcastle. With a spatial query capability through the Jupyter Notebooks integration, we can easily perform a wide variety of analyses. We can pivot data, visualize analysis output, and compare results of different scales in one integrated environment. Here, for example, we analyze the impact of floods on society. We want to analyze the impact on vulnerable people and therefore ask questions such how many one-person households are located in flood-prone areas? Therefore, we can interact directly with the attributed table and the spatial output. We can look at this question from different angles. We can focus on the total number of affected households, look at the flood depth, or the largest flooded area as such. If we want to focus on specific areas identified in query results, we can select a subset of the layer with a query and visualize this area and continue with that specific subset and further analysis. In the next example, we want to assess the impact of flooding on infrastructure. We can ask questions such as, where are most of the flooded buildings located in the city? And how much financial damage is caused by flooded buildings? This information was estimated using various sources on building classification, year of construction, use and depth. We can query the building's data set for the number of affected buildings grouped by different flood depths and visualize this with a stacked bar chart. As we have access to a variety of different data sources, we can update our model with the latest real-time information on dynamic data. Therefore, we can schedule a Python script in our geoprocessing toolbox in order to update dynamic data sets and then send the latest data to ArcGIS Online to use for our dashboards. We can create a new script or upload an already defined script. Later, we can schedule the script to run at a specific time. Those updates will be available in Operations Dashboard for the stakeholders to see. Potential datasets which will be updated are river level measures, daily accumulated rainfall, temperature, and in terms of traffic, the latest CCTV images, data on incidents and accidents. Now, in addition to the different analyses presented in the individual scenarios, we can also combine those different data sets for a more integrated overview of flood impact. Therefore, we will use Operations Dashboard to visualize the assessment of flooding on the environment, society, and infrastructure. We will see how we can use an exploratory visualization tool that serves as a prototype to show how data of different origins can be combined in a web application. Here, we see the study area of Newcastle. In this web application, we integrate indicators of the current air temperature, the current river level, which is also then visualized as a graph down below. 
we can filter this graph to a specific date or time. Right next to it, we see the daily accumulated rainfall measured on the Newcastle campus and acquired by sensor data from the Urban Observatory. We can also use the sidebar in order to zoom in on a specific area and see the corresponding details. Here we can select the word Wolsington, which we have identified previously. We can see how the map has changed its extent. If we go over here, we see a list of financial damage estimates. And down below, we see a column chart counting the number of flooded buildings per depth. The list on the right gives us individual information on the surrounding land. We can also perform more detailed analysis by choosing different scales of the study area. Therefore, we go back to the scale bar and we choose MSOA, LSOA and OA. We can now see how the map extent is filtered to the scale selected. We also get information about incidents from the surrounding area as well as CCTV camera images. For the output area scale, we have indicators showing us the number of vulnerable population groups for one-person households and people over 65 years. We can also include a 3D visualization of the flooded area as well as flood impacted infrastructure. We can also provide bookmarks of different impacted areas which makes it easier for stakeholders to identify. This visualization tool currently serves as a test environment in order to get feedback from different stakeholders on their required analytical capabilities. I hope to use that feedback and to integrate it into my further PhD research. The final geospatial component of this project is the Experience Builder. The Experience Builder helps us to bring the different outputs of the tools together and summarizes the workflow as a storyline. The storyline is structured according to the different research topics. The background section, for instance, provides the user with necessary information on the research topic, in particular, surface water flooding. Further, descriptions and examples of current available hazard maps are provided. Links are given to individual sites for more background information. The visualization of the operations dashboard is also included. The conclusion tab brings me to the summary of our presentation. In summary, we can conclude that the integrated flood database model can help us to realize several different benefits. The integration of heterogeneous data sources, including static and dynamic data, in one common framework can improve the databases for flood risk assessment and decision support for multiple organizations. Information relevant to different organizations is now available in one integrated database model. Hence, they can gain a quick location overview of different city conditions through shared analysis of common data sets. This can lead to better communication during incidents and can also serve as a better tool for strategic planning. The current relational database model can be easily extended with other relevant data sets, such as the new census reporting data. Standard Python queries help us to extract and transform data for any study area within the UK within only seconds. All in all, this flood database model can help to work towards a resilient city with a sustainable infrastructure, identify risks in advance, and help to respond to them at an early stage. I would like to give thanks to the APSRC and Ordnance Survey for funding my research and the CDT and Geospatial Systems. Now that we have reached the end of our presentation, I would like to thank you once again for joining. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit. Until then, all the best. Bye.